So our Sky Talk today will be by Teresa McLaurin, who's a fellow and senior director of DFT Architecture at ARM in Austin, Texas. In Building Resiliency, the Next Imperative to Design, Teresa will share with us how resiliency on silicon will evolve as designs continue to get smaller and faster, even as we run up against the limitations of Moore's Law. So, Teresa. Thank you very much. All right, then. Okay, so I'm going to talk about building resiliency, which I think is the next imperative in design. And because I'm a DFT engineer, I'm going to use DFT to explain some of the things we might be going through in the future, near future. Okay. All right, we all know that resiliency is the capacity to quickly overcome adversity. And in silicon, it's the ab ability to overcome functional failures. So we wish we could have resiliency in every single part, but it's expensive. So we use it sparingly. And in fact, we try not to use it at all. And in design for test, over the years, there's been a lot of resistance to adding DFT architecture. And the reason for that is cost. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about some of the learnings of those scenarios and how they might apply to our journey in adding resiliency. All right, now, I know most of you may, or many of you may already know about SCAN, but it's important to this talk. So I'm going to explain a little bit of tutorial here. It'll only take a minute, so bear with me. So the way, SCAN is one of the biggest proponents of DFT, right? And so what we do is we take all of the registers in the design and we concatenate them into a shift register, or what we call a scan chain. And then we take the, S, the scan enable signal and we hold it high and we shift all this data through the scan chains. And then we pull the scan enable low and the signal goes through the combinational logic and gets captured into other flops. Then we pull scan enable back high again and we shift out the data. And this gives us near 100% controllability and observability. Right? So we can test the design fairly well. However, it's not a functional test. It doesn't test whether the, the design is going to work properly. All it does is test it structurally. It tests for manufacturing defects. Right? That's important. But there's a couple other things you need to know about SCAN. When we shift the, those registers, we have to turn on all the clocks at the same time and the data is toggling at about 50%. This uses a lot of power, and most of the time it uses way more power than the infrastructure that was put in place for functional operation. So we have to think about that. So what we do is we slow it way down. And in that manner, we keep the, the power uh, infrastructure, the power lower than what you need for the infrastructure for functional operation. And the other thing you need to know about SCAN is it doesn't run the design at all in the manner it's being, going to be run functionally because of this clocking, or this is one of the biggest reasons. So we slow the clock way down, and we want to do an at-speed test during capture, and all of a sudden we bang the whole clock tree with these at-speed clocks. Well, that's not the way the design is run functionally. In functional operation, you have these at-speed clocks, and you get your VDD down to a certain level. Well, when you do that, you get, when you get the slow shift to the, the high capture, you get this ground bounce, and you have to be careful of that. So that's not all about SCAN. SCAN is expensive. Right? There's two types of SCAN. There's latch-based SCAN, which is called LSSD, and there's MUXD SCAN. And in the case of LSSD, a, an entire latch is added. Right, and a master latch is added, and the slave latch has grown a little bit. So you, you grow your register by about 30%. And in the case of MUX-D, you add a MUX to the functional path, and that adds about 10% to the area. So if you have a critical path, you're putting this MUX right in it. But that's not all. You now have to concatenate all of those registers into these scan chains. And of course, you want them to be as close as possible. You don't want to route all across the design. And we all know that wires have not shrunk in the manner that logic has, as technology's gotten, gotten smaller. 
So you want them as close together as possible, but you have to be careful about hold time. And so we add buffers. So you can see that all of this really affects power, performance, and area, which is what we, we are all trying to make be as good as possible. So why do we do it? Why would we ever add scan to our designs? Well, when I first started engineering, we didn't use scan. We only used functional patterns. And what would happen in the companies that I worked was that you would do your functional verification. You take those patterns, you run them through fault grading, and then you would put them on the tester. And where those patterns were good for verification, they weren't good for looking for manufacturing defects because they had little holes in them. And so they would take one engineer, and they leave them on the design for multiple years, generally, and say, you make more functional patterns. Right? We really need you to make functional patterns. And, and so they would, but it would take them years because this is what it looked like. This is what they, they would fault grade it, and they would be missing little pieces here and there. And it was really hard to write a functional pattern that would capture all of those areas. And so that's why it took so long. Uh, in the end, they, you know, a scan was accepted. And at first, they tried to do something called partial scan. They said, you know, we're in functional patterns. And what we'll do is we'll just add a little bit of scan because it costs so much. And so that's what we did. But, or some people did. And the thing is, if you looked at the engineering effort of running functional patterns to catch all those areas or creating the partial scan to catch those areas, it was, it was still pretty high. Whereas running full scan, you know, your scan chains get inserted automatically, your patterns are all created automatically, and um, you get test coverage right away. So the effort was considerably less. And the timing, you could have all of your patterns from manufacturing ready when your silicon came out. Now, of course, it affects your PPA. Right? But it was decided, OK, we need to live with that. We need to li live with the PPA. And you know, we were shrinking technology, and it was getting uh, silicon was getting faster and less power. And the effectiveness of scan, of course, uh, is pretty high because you can cover the whole design. And I knew scan was really here to stay. I was in a conference once, and there was a, a speaker from Motorola about PowerPC. And they used LSSD. And invariably, somebody would ask a question. And she said, we have full scan. And somebody asked the question, how much did it cost? And her answer was, we don't care. Now, why wouldn't they care? Because there's something that was more costly. So when you test a part and it fails at die, at the wafer, now you throw out the die. When you test a part and it, it, and it passes the wafer test and you go on to package, you spend the money to, to package it. Also, more tester time. And testers are very, very expensive. So tester time is very expensive. And so if it fails a package, now you throw out that part, and it was exp exponentially more expensive for that failure. Now, some parts, if they're going into a critical application or if they're not sure about the test yet, they will then go to board test. And they may have a sampling of the parts or all the parts that go through this board test. And the board test is even more expensive because you're running all these different functional patterns trying to find corner cases and trying to make it fail. So, that's exponentially more expensive than the package part failure. So say it passes your board, and now you send it out to, to your customer. They put it in their system where they have hundreds and hundreds of parts. One fails. They have to go through and figure out which part failed. Now, you talk about expensive, right? That is really expensive in time and effort and in reputation. If you do it enough time, you're going to lose your customers. So you want to make sure that you have a good test. And that means you need to have a good test in time when your silicon comes out, because you don't want to ship out bad parts. I'm going to talk about market window a little bit. Um, so you, you have a customer who has a, a product that they want to put out at Christmas time. And you say, OK, I've got to get my part out at this time. You have the silicon ready, but you don't have a test ready. You cannot ship that customer bad parts, that's just going to cause them delays and them to miss their market window. So you need your test, and you, you need a high quality test, and you need it quickly. And just one other thing I'll point out is that if you're the first out uh, with a product, like a CPU, you get the most money. And 
over time, it goes down fairly quickly. I mean, these are, these are real products uh, that, have, that this happened to them over time. And, uh, and why? Why? Because you get competition. And, or in general, technology just goes down in price pretty quickly. So it just shows that, that uh, why the test instance is so important. OK, so we started putting scan into our designs. And our des the technology shrunk, and so the designs got larger and larger, but the number of pins didn't grow that much. So we still had the same amount of scan ins and scan outs. And what I didn't mention when I was talking about scan is the first time you shift, you get the coverage of those flip flops. But the second and third and hundreds and thousands of times you shift, you don't get any coverage. You only get coverage during those capture cycles. And so what we were having to do, because we were having a few scan in, scan outs, and we had this large design, our scan chains got longer and longer. And so we had all this time where we were not actually getting test coverage. Right? So in 2001, uh, the ITRS predicted that tests would become more expensive than silicon sometime in the future. And the reason being is that we were creating such large scan patterns that the testers were having to reload the patterns. And this took seconds of time. Now, testers, as I mentioned, are really expensive. And the tester time is expensive. And it, the test cost is really charged per second on the design. And so you want to keep that to just a few seconds. And here we were taking seconds of time to reload the patterns. And it was unacceptable. And it was going to cause the test to go up higher than silicon. So we thought, hmm, this put the test community in uproar. We, this can't be true. We, we must do something. We thought, oh, you know what? There's logic built self-test, self logic built-in self-test, or LBIST. And um, in there, you don't need any memory for patterns, because it has a pseudo-random random pattern generator. And uh, it just it puts in these patterns, and it tests the design. And then it has a signature register that says, oh, you got the right answer. Now, there's a couple of gotchas about LBIST. One is that the signature register, you can't have any unknowns or exits, because you won't get the same signature every time. And the other one is they're pseudo-random patterns. So it takes a lot more of them to get your coverage than it would for a deterministic scan pattern. But you say, wait, aren't you trying to get your pattern numbers down? Yeah, well. Yes, we are trying to get our pattern numbers down, but it's OK. This is a lot cheaper than reloading the memories. Running 10 times the number of patterns is cheaper than, than having to reload the memory with patterns. But there were some other gotchas. We couldn't get the test coverage up as high to get the manufacturing de de defects so, because they were pseudo-random. And you could add test points and get your test coverage up, but now you're starting to affect your PPA again. And you were needing a lot of test points in order to get the coverage you needed. So we said, OK, what? I know what we'll do. We're going to add scan patterns. We're going to top off with scan patterns. And so that's what we did. But what happened there was that this, the Elvis was getting all the easy patterns. And the scan patterns were having to go through and get the hard patterns. And they'd run a scan pattern and get a few faults. They'd run another scan pattern, and they'd get a few more faults. And they found that the test pattern volume didn't go down that much. So this was sort of abandoned for reducing uh, test pattern volume on the tester. Now, around 2003, uh, Mentor Graphics invented something called Test Compress. Now, Test Compress is pretty cool. It, it, it allows you to have just a few scan ins. It decompressed them. Then you had many, many scan pattern, many, many scan chains. So you had, your scan chains got much shorter. And then you had a few scan outs, and you came out to the tester. Now, this took a little bit longer because you had to do the decompressing and compressing and figure out the data. But it didn't matter because your scan chains were so much shorter. So this was pivotal, I believe, in that uh, test did not ever become more expensive than silicon. All right, so what did we learn? We learned that this test was too expensive until it wasn't, right? Something else was more expensive. And test was getting more expensive. And when we had to, we innovated. And today, almost all digital designs uh, contain scan and compression. I know this talk's supposed to be about resiliency. 
And so the reason many of us are concerned about resiliency is because of automotive. And in, in 2004, this is the number of arm cores that were in an automobile. And they were small ones. And not only were they small, they were in the older technologies because they were reliable. You fast forward to 2016, and it's grown significantly. And that's because of uh, assisted driving. And those, they weren't just small cores, low performing cores. They were high performing CPUs, and they wanted to be in the newer technologies to meet those performances. Uh, you fast forward to today, and there's so many parts in a car, it would be near impossible to list them. Okay, but back in 2016, when we very first started, our, our parts, our high performance cores were starting to go into these um, assisted driving applications. Uh, they, we had to think about what to do for safety. Now, the world knew that we needed safety, right? And they created this standard called the ISO 26262. And it was for functional safety of electrical devices inside of a car. And they had these safety integrity levels, alpha through delta. And alpha was where it didn't matter if your, if your part died, no, no, no human life would be lost. Nothing serious would happen. Yeah, your radio might stop working. And in delta, it means that, yes, this is very serious, serious if your part does not uh, work, and human life, human life could be lost. And they had these uh, classifications, right? Severity, controllability, and exposure. And they said, okay, depending upon where you fall in here, this is how you classify whether you're A, B, C, or D. For instance, D, or delta, might be that it's life-threatening, there's high probability of it happening, and it's difficult to control. For instance, if you're in an autonomous car, and there's no steering wheel, and that part goes bad, your camera goes bad, that could be devastating. On the other hand, uh, we'll look at acyl beta, and it could still be fairly serious that something might happen, but you have controllability, right? You have the steering wheel to take over. But still for acyl beta, you had to do some testing. And you had to test the design that was uh, in that critical area, and you had to do it in certain intervals, depending upon what the application was. And so, you know, our, our, our partners would come back to us and ask, all right, we've got your part. We've got your processors in these areas. What do we do to test them? We said, well, you know, um, you could take one CPU off at a time and test it with Elvis. Well, Elvis came back. And then you put it back online. It makes you a little less performant because you're only running three CPUs, but you could go through all of them in that manner and test them. And it just so happened on our, on our cores, we had the capability to um, uh, power down cores to save power. And you could use the same mechanism, clean the caches, take it down, and, uh, and then do your testing and bring it back up. We just wouldn't take the power down. And they said, yeah, this might work. But the issue with Elbist is it took too long. Because we didn't want the CPUs to be offline too long. And you had this interval of time you had to test the entire design. And Elbist was just taking too long. So what do we do? You could always add more test points but it's not very helpful for PPA. So one of the things uh, that was done was, well, what happens? Remember I told you that all that shift, we don't get any coverage. Just the capture cycle. And we said, what happens if we just increase the number of clocks in a capture cycle? Now, this is an experiment we did on one of our CPUs that showed that the orange line is, uh, the bottom line is when the test coverage was only one capture cycle. And you can see it's only about 83% coverage with this 5,000 patterns and with 5,000 patterns. And so we said, okay, what if we went to two? When we went to two capture cycles, we jumped above 90% coverage, which is what we were looking for for ACL beta. And we increased it to three and four. The test coverage did not increase, but the number of test points needed decreased. That's the bars in this chart. Uh, and so you can see with four capture cycles, we went down from 4,500 to 4,000 test points. 
this was at no cost to the silicon at all. Okay. Then another innovation that occurred was, and this actually was an innovation that was done for compression, because they're still trying to get the patterns, number of patterns down, designs are still growing. And they said, you know, what happens if we observe during shift? Remember, we weren't getting any coverage during shift. What happens if we observe during shift? And they did it, and not only that, they shared those observation points, so they didn't grow the number of test points in their design. And so we said, yeah, that could work in Nelvis. So actually, this is another design. We tried this out on, on, on one of our cores, and it made a huge difference. Those two lines, like the bottom line is before we used what's called observation during scan, and the, and the top line is when we used it. The number of test points is not different. The only difference is we're actually using, observing during shift, right? And then we're sharing those, uh, those test points. And you can see we jumped from about 87% test coverage to 97% test coverage with 1,000 scan patterns. That's huge, right? So what did we learn? Elvis was too expensive until we had to have it for human safety, until something else was more expensive, right? And when we had to, we innovated. All right, so that's we talked about ASL beta a little bit. Now, for ASL Delta, you have to be monitoring constantly. And um, in, in the space industry and in, in aircraft, they've had to do this for a very long time. And they use things like triple core lockstep as an example of, of a, a redundancy or resiliency that might be used, or dual core lockstep. And triple core lockstep is when you have three CPUs, for instance, and um, there's a voting mechanism. So if, if one doesn't match, then it votes, and everything's still safe. And dual core lockstep is when you have two, and if they don't match, then you have to have software or hardware do something to keep everybody safe. Because triple core lockstep was you know, way more expensive than dual core lockstep, and automobiles do not cost as much as airplanes do. So OK, we're going to go for dual core lockstep. So that worked really well for both um, permanent failures and transient failures. Now, ASO beta, when we ran LBIST, we were checking for permanent failures. We weren't checking for transient failures. So transient failures are generally when an alpha particle or neutron hits the silicon and causes a state to change. Now, what often happens is that if it's in combinational logic, it'll go through and it'll get masked by something else. So you'll never see the failure come out. But you still have to check for it. So the dual core lockstep checks for it. But that doesn't happen during ASO beta sort of ignored. But you know, so what happens, people start thinking about it. And you could do something called flop parity, which is expensive, but it's only 10 to 15% area difference as opposed to dual core lockstep. And that could possibly work for ASL beta. And then of course, there's always these resilient cells. There's hundreds of papers written about it. This is, happens to be Razor which ARM worked with the University of Michigan on. But that's another way where if, if a particle strikes this uh, register, then the flip-flop, then it recovers. It, it knows there's an issue. That's also a possibility. OK, so resilience is a good thing, right? We don't use it because it's expensive. So now it's time. It's time to do something about it. So one of the, um, one of the some of the research that we did was to take a look at a CPU and find out what parts of the CPU actually cause a failure. And what was found was pretty interesting. It said that um, they found that 80% of the errors that got propagated were caused by 10% of the registers. And 50% of the registers never, ever caused an error to propagate never caused an error to propagate. And they said that uh, all of the errors came out on 65% of the pins, and 80% of the errors came out on 20% of the ports. Now, this is powerful information, right? If you're trying to figure out how to do resiliency in a more costly way, this is really powerful information. So they came up with something called a, an architectural vulnerability factor, because they, they, in addition, they looked at each block and said, which ones 
are the ones that are, would most likely cause an issue if there were a transient fa failure, error. So they did further work, and they said the problem is what they had to do there is they had to do error fault injection, and that means that you have to take patterns that that actually run the whole design, right? So you're exercising the whole design, and then you have to fault inger, inject an error on every single vector. This is expensive. It's expensive in time, and it's expensive in CPU. And uh, so, so how can we do this better? So they, they decided to take a look at a formal-based application. So they said, well, let's go ahead and, and, and use formal to try to figure this out. And they divided the, the core or the device into three different areas. An, an architectural area that would never, ever cause a failure. Yeah, something like debug. You don't run debug during functional operation. So you can just pull that out. You don't care about it. If it, some, it gets hit by a transient uh, fault, it, it doesn't matter. And then they said, okay, there's also these conditional ones, right, where you might have a flag and then some payload happens. And it could be that these conditional ones rarely happen. You, and you could take that into account. And then the other part is they'll say, okay, what, uh, the rest of it, we're just gonna say that it can always cause an error. And what they found with this methodology to figure out uh, which ones were most vulnerable is that they could run 276 times faster using this uh, formal capability than doing the, the fault injection and simulation. That's pretty huge. Right, that's, part, that's one of the biggest problems is that we just can't, uh, we can't get the coverage and we, can't, we don't have time to do it. So the problem is that it was 4.7 times more pessimistic. So they said, okay, why is it 4.7 times more pessimistic? And so they started looking at it. But what they also noticed was that if you look at the blue line, which is the PACE, their tool, formal-based tool, and you look at the red line, which is the error fault injection, you can see the exact same pattern, which means that across the different blocks, they were finding the same vulnerability. That was pretty big. That proved that the work that they did was actually pertinent. They just had to figure out how to remove that pessimism. So they took a look at this and they said, well, why was it so pessimistic? And one of the reasons that it was so pessimistic is because they didn't take into account all those errors that got, that got masked by other combination logic. They just let them all go through during uh, functional operation. And the other thing that they found was that the patterns they used to figure out which was gonna be conditional did not cover the entire design. And that what they had assumed is that if they couldn't figure out if it was gonna be conditional, they were gonna call it always. It was always gonna cause an issue. And since their pattern did not cover all functionality, they called a lot of things always that were conditional. So that's, um, so that's some, some extra work that was, has been done. So this is pretty interesting, right? This is pretty powerful. If you can run and figure out where you need to put your, your uh, resiliency in your design, you can do it a lot cheaper. All right, so over time, what we do is, um, when we're worried about something, we hit it with a sledgehammer. Sort of like DCLS, right? We are comparing the entire CPU, whereas the entire CPU is not gonna cause a failure. It's not gonna cause an issue. Or we cut corners, as we did with transient errors and ASL beta. What we need is a just right size glass, right? We don't want it too large, we don't want it too small. Now, resiliency is too expensive until it's not, until something else, such as human life, is more expensive. And when it is too expensive, we innovate. And we're really good at it. And it's actually your job to innovate going forward. You need to figure this out. Because I think this is the time for us to now make resiliency uh, affordable, so we can use it not just, not just for uh, human safety areas, but for other areas as well, such as in the cloud, where they're having problems with the silent data corruption. So there's, there's all kinds of area we can use resiliency if we can figure out how to reduce the cost. All right, so last month, 
I was in Ireland, and I kissed the Blarney Stone. And the Blarney Stone is a centuries-old tradition that is said to give you the gift of eloquence and persuasion. Now, it's up to you to decide if I persuaded you that resilience is the next imperative in design. All right, thank you.